Welcome to the journey. Thanks for being here today, and we are glad that you are here. Whether you're with us online or whether you're here in person, we're glad that you're here. So a couple weeks ago, we had a message, teach us, Lord, how to prioritize. Last week, teach us how to pray. This week, teach us how to win at life. Now that sounds like a solid plan. But before we begin, here are a few announcements for you. Now it's time for the call to worship. In Hebrews 10, it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And then in the message, the same pa passage, it says this, let's do it full of belief, confident we're presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip onto the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. So everybody, let's keep a firm grip on those promises because God always keeps his word. And that's who we worship today. So everybody, get ready to worship. Have you ever seen the wonder in the glimmer of her sight as the eyes begin to open and the blindness meets the light. If you have so say, I see the world in light. I see the world in wonder. I see the world in life, bursting in living color. I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light. Have you ever seen the wonder in the air of second life? Having come out of the waters with the old one left behind. If you have so say, I see the world in light, I see the world in wonder, I see the world in life, bursting in living color, I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light. I see the world in grace, I see the world in gospel, I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light, and I'm walking in the wonder, you're the wonder in the wild, turning wilderness to wonder, if you have so say, I see the world in love. I see the world in freedom, I see the Jesus way, you're the wonder in the wild. I see the world your way. And I'm not afraid to follow. 
I see the world your way, and I'm not ashamed to say so. I see the Jesus way, and I'm walking in the light. I see the world in light, I see the world in wonder, I see the world in life, bursting in living color. I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light. I see the world in grace, I see the world in gospel, I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light. And I'm walking in the wonder. You're the wonder and the wild, a turning wilderness to wonder. If you have so say, I see the world in love, I see the world in freedom, I see the Jesus way, and you're the wonder and the wild. I see the world in light, I see the world in wonder. I see the world in life, bursting in living color. I see the world your way. I see the world in wonder. I see the world in light, bursting in living color.
How great is the love that you have poured out on us that we could be called the children of God. And John asserts, that is, that is what we are, your children. Jesus, thank you for coming for us, for ransoming your life, giving your life that we might be restored to a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come today and meet us in our worship. Grace us with your presence. Fill us with your power. Gift us for your purposes. Continue to form us into the likeness of Jesus. We pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Great to see all of you this morning. Uh, those of you who are worshiping with us uh, in uh, the sanctuary, those of you who are watching online, uh, just an honor uh, that you would share uh, part of your Sunday morning with, with me and with our church family and, um, and fittingly uh, in, in worship and service to our Creator. Um, I wonder how many of you um, have something that you want to win at. Do you have something you want to win at? The lottery? The lottery? <laughs> all right, all right. Do you play? <laughs> no. no. See, now that's... <clears throat> going to be difficult. And if, you're, if you're an athlete, you know, right, if you were playing for um, the Atlanta Braves that, that you wanted to, to win the World Series, and, and you did, and if you play in the NFL, you want to, to win the, uh, the Holy Grail, you want to win the Super Bowl and, and, and help hoist the, the Vince Lombardi trophy. If somebody, um, people lined up at the start line of the LA Marathon today, and, and a lot of people ran to finish, and, and that's a win for them, but some people wanted, went out there and they wanted to, to win the race, and, and somebody did, right? Athletes want to win at their sport. Some of us um, want to win in our careers, right? If we're running, running a business, we want our business to, the, to be the best, to get the largest part of the market so that we can um, succeed in our business and pay our employees and, and have a successful career. Um, or, uh, you know, if you're... Um, 
trying to climb the corporate ladder and, and move your way up through the, through the system. You want to you be the best at what you do. Some of us, we want to win at home. We want to be great parents and, and be the best parents that we can be. And some of us, wanna, we want to be a great spouse to, to, um, to our spouses. Um, if you're a, a plumber or a care provider or a teacher or a mechanic, whatever it is that, that you want to, to be good at, you want to win at what you're doing. I, I want to be the best pastor I can be, and I, I, want, to be, um, I want to be good at it. And maybe some of you are like, well, I'm not really the competitive type. I, I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't need to win. But I would say even, even to those who don't have that competitive streak, what matters to you? What's, what's important to you? And whatever it is that's important to you, do you at least want to be better at it than someone who does it poorly? Right? You, you want to be better at it than, than someone who's bad at it. And then, you know, how much better and, and how poor and how good is good enough? And, and you know, I don't necessarily want to be the, the best husband or, or the best father or, or the best pastor for bragging rights. It's like, right? It's, Look at me. I'm, I want to be the best at it because I have um, a spouse that I love, and, and I want her to have the best. I, I have kids that I, I, that I love, and I, and I want them to be the, uh, I want to be the best father that, that, that I can for them. Um, and, and, like, for them, they're stuck with me. Like, my spouse doesn't get another spouse. My kids don't get another dad. So if I'm not the best, that I, I, mean, I, I want to be the best for them because they deserve the best. And, and maybe, and I think this might be true for, for a lot of us, that this sense of, of greatness, of, of winning, ha, has been so elusive to us for so long that, that we've given up hope on, on really being great and maybe have just settled for hoping to be good enough or, or maybe just trying to continue to lower the bar and lower the bar and lower the bar so that maybe we never succeeded or anything, but we just feel less bad about our, our failures. Maybe resignation is set into the point that all you're really trying to do is not achieve any level of success or greatness, is, is just to make it through another day. We noted um, a few weeks ago in this series that while when people talked about Jesus during Jesus' life, they, they um, often referred to him as Jesus. They talked about Jesus. But, but when they talked to Jesus, that, that one of the most common ways that, that people addressed Jesus was this teacher or, or rabbi, which is Hebrew for teacher. They, when they talked to Jesus, they, they called him teacher. And if Jesus is a teacher, then those that, who were um, with him were, were students. And, and that Jesus, as, as a teacher, had a message and had methods that were uncommon. They were unconventional, the, the message and the methods. And so in this series, we're, we're kind of just coming back to that place of saying, well, what does it mean to be a student of Jesus? Am I a student? Do I call him teacher? And if I call him teacher, what is he teaching me? And how am I learning him? How, how am I relating him to, to him, not just as a savior or, or not just as a friend, but, but as a teacher? Am I learning from him? Am I growing in the things that are important to him and the things that he's teaching me? So we looked at the, the um, ask Jesus in the, in the first week of the series, teach us, Jesus, how to prioritize. Jesus said, seek first. You want to know what's important? Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and, and you'll learn all the other things you know. Put his kingdom first. Last week, we asked Jesus to teach us to pray. And when Jesus taught us, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, right? At the heart of his teaching about prayer was where we started out, Father, we have this relationship who is God, holy be your, hallowed be your name, holy is your name, your kingdom come because you are Father, because you are holy, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus teaches us to pray. Prioritize, kingdoms at the heart of it. Teach us to pray, kingdoms at the heart of it. One of Jesus' um, favorite teaching methods, we taught, you know, he, he was always telling stories um, parables, earthly stories, or heavenly stories with earthly meanings. But those stories often were occasioned by, by teachable moments. Jesus was always teaching 
in the context of life. Like they're just walking down the road one day and he would see something and he would teach them about what he just saw. And, and today we're going to look at a teachable moment, one of those, one of those scenes. And, and it's in Mark chapter 9 and uh, beginning at, whoa, verse 33. says, they, as Jesus and his disciples, came to Capernaum, and they'd been walking on their way to Capernaum. And along the way, when they were in the house, Jesus asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? What were you, you guys were having some kind of feud, some kind of spat when we were walking down the road. What were you arguing about? And it says, they kept quiet because they had been arguing about who was the greatest. They kept quiet. They didn't want to admit it. Jesus heard them, knew what they were arguing about, probably because he heard them. And so he calls them together, and sitting down, he called his disciples, and he said to them, anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last and the servant of all. Now, it's really not surprising that there was competition among Jesus' followers, among his students, because they, come, they came from across the this, this spectrum of, of political convictions and, and religious beliefs. There, there were some who were like Matthew, who had, was actually uh, um, a, a, an employee of the Roman government and, and um, cooperated with them by collecting taxes from the Jews, from his own people on behalf of, of the government. Then there was Simon the Zealot, who was um, actually a, a radical trying to um, uh, mount an insurrection. The Zealots were trying to mount an insurrection ag against um, the government. Um, and, and across, you know, they were Jewish people who were um, very um, committed to the Jewish and, and others who were less so, right? They come ac from across the political and the religious spectrum, so it would be natural that there be some tensions um, between them. And we, we know that there was competition because there's um, a great story, uh, one of my uh, just really hilarious story in, um, in, that John tells about the day of, of the resurrection when they had heard about um, that, that, that the tomb was empty, that, that two of disciples, Jesus' disciples um, ran to the tomb to, to see um, for themselves what had happened and what was going on. And, and John's telling the story, and, and he says three times in the story that, that he got there before Peter, that the disciple whom Jesus got there first that he was ahead, that he won the race, right? That there's this competition between them. And, and I think one of the things that's interesting about this, this occasion that Jesus addresses here, this teachable moment, is Jesus doesn't dismiss the desire. He doesn't stop the disciples and say, hey, hey, whoa, guys. You know, this whole thing about who's the best, who's the greatest, you shouldn't even be thinking that. That should, that should not even be on your radar. That should not be your concern. Jesus doesn't do that. Martin Luther King um, makes this point well in one of his famous, famous sermons. It's called The Drum Major Instinct. That, that Jesus understood that within many of us there is a desire to, to be great, to, to make a difference, to, to, to be the leader of the band. And Jesus doesn't, doesn't fault his disciples for their desire for greatness. What he does say is in this per, pursuit of of greatness. Don't stop wanting it. But in your pursuit of greatness, move to the back of the line. Take the seat in the back of the bus. Instead of doing what, what we talk about, you know, look out for number one, he's saying, look out for number 44 or number 52. Look out for the person at the back, not try to be the person at the front. You want to be great? He says, you want to be great? I don't feel great. I'm glad that you want to be great. You want to be great, serve. Serve your friends. Serve your family. Serve your neighbors. Serve your coworkers. Serve your boss. Serve your mother-in-law. Serve your ex. 
And you're looking at the text and going, whoa, whoa, whoa. It does not say anything about my mother-in-law or my ex in this passage, right? No, what does it say? If you want to become great, it says, be a servant of all. Right? A servant of all. And I'm almost certain that all must include, like, everyone, right? Become a servant of all. You, you want to win at life, to leave a less legacy, to make a mark on the world, don't stop wanting it. Just move to the back of the line. Continuing with the teachable moment, Jesus, again, as often is the case, right? He's started this lesson with his disciples, with the students who are walking along with them. He says, let me show you something. And he, and he takes a child took the child, placed the child among them in his arms, and said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Now, children in Jesus' day were an inheritance. They, they were valuable to the family. In large respect, because like we have retirement plans, and, and I think many of us who are adults now hope not to be a burden on our children. Their, their children actually were like their 403B. It's like these, they're going to take care of you when you get old, so you wanted to have a few of them around to like run the business and to provide for you when you couldn't provide for yourself anymore. Children also, the, the mortality rate was very high, so there was kind of a this sense in which many people, there was not a full investment until they were sure the child was going to live. They didn't have, like, child protective services like we, we have now. Children didn't have assets. They, so in that sense, they weren't an asset in their household in, until they grew up. So they were not dismissed, but they didn't have privileges. They didn't have rights. And Jesus says, okay, he takes this child in his arms and he says, you want to win at life, win with children. Win with those who can't advance your cause or improve your standing because they're powerless. Win with those people. Matthew chapter 18, Matthew tells the same story or the, um, the same general idea as, as Mark does, and there's some nuances in their stories, and it's one of the fascinating features of the biographies of Jesus is you have um, uh, each of these authors telling um, the same story, but they all wrote to a different audience and, and sometimes with, um, with a, for a different purpose or a different point that they were trying to make and always from their own unique perspective. And so they tell these same stories, but they tell them a little bit differently. And in Matthew's story, same kind of context. And at this time, it's, Matthew says that they actually went to Jesus and says, teach us um, what it, you know, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And in, in, this, in Matthew's account, Jesus says, true I tell you, unless you not just welcome little children. And Matthew says, unless you become like little children. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, he says, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Like little children, often um, I think people interpret as to be like a child is to be trusting, is to be innocent, um, still is, is to have just that kind of like um, childlike faith in, in the Father. And, and there are contexts that you find that, that idea in the New Testament, in Jesus' teachings. But that's actually not what he says here. In, in, this, in this context, what Jesus is saying is, he says, take the lowly position of a, a child. Humble yourself, humble yourself like a child. Become like children. Become like someone who isn't trying to improve their own standing or advance their own cause. And again, kingdom is the operative word. 
Because what? If you're sold out to your own kingdom, if your agenda is trying to advance your cause to promote your kingdom, you become less valuable, less focused on, less committed to, less helpful for the kingdom of heaven. Because why, right? The, you, two kingdoms. You, you can't live into and serve both of them. If you're serving this kingdom, you're not serving that kingdom. Become like a child who is not worried about advancing their kingdom, wholly committed as a servant in God's kingdom. Okay, so Jesus has this great teachable moment with his disciples, complete with this, with this great object lesson that he's given to them. And in a nod to every parent or teacher or preacher who has ever tried to impart wisdom to a student with a great lesson and a great object lesson, and a call to action, who then sits back to watch their students go out and soar in society with the infinite wisdom that has been bestowed upon them. And just a short time later, we find out how Jesus' lesson landed for them. This story occurs in Mark chapter 9, towards the end of the chapter. The next passage we're going to look at is in Mark chapter 10, towards the end of that chapter. So we don't have a, a definitive timeline here, you know, it was a day or a week. But in the context, right, this is, this is something, this happened, and then a short time later, this next event happened. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do whatever we ask. Wait, what? Teach, so, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. And I'm just like, I'm imagining in, in my head two of Deb's students coming to her and saying, Mrs. Vandervon, we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. And I'm like, is she like, does she laugh under her breath? Does, the, does she laugh out loud? Does she laugh so hard that she snorts? If she's drinking something that has come out of her nose, right? <laughs> teach, right, no way on teach. And Jesus actually, he, he bites a little bit. He doesn't write them a blank check. He says, okay, right, I'll bite here. What is it that you want me to do? They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. By glory in your coming kingdom. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism, baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Now, at the time that this was happening, right, they're asking Jesus to be at the right and his left. They say, you know, he says, can you, can you drink the cup? That... I, I just imagine what it must have been like when they watched what was going to unfold in just a short time. When, when they discover, when they realize what baptism Jesus was talking about, his arrest and, and being mocked and spat upon and stripped down and beaten and nailed to a cross. Sure, Jesus, we can do, we can follow you. And, and that's where Jesus says, that's where this is going. What must it have been like to recall that moment? Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. He says, guys, you're a part of a long story. And those, those positions in the coming kingdom, they exist. But that's not for you to determine. It's not for you to decide. And I wonder, was it, is it Abraham, the father of faith, or, or, or Moses, who, who sits in one of those seats, who 
um, led the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt and, you know, is the, the, the central character of the Old Testament. Was it, was it David who was, um, had the, was the king from which the line of Jesus would come from? Was it the prophet Elijah? But that's not for us to decide. My Father in heaven will determine that. Then, it says the ten heard about this. James and John come to Jesus. The other ten heard about this, and it says they were indignant with James and John. One of the authenticating components of, um, of the Gospels to me is how when these authors tell the stories about themselves, that, that they, they include like how fumbled and bumbled and messed up they were. I, if you're again, if you're going to make up a story, aren't you going to make yourself good, look good in the story? And they're continuously showing how they messed up, how they misunderstood, how they confused things. They include this. They could have said right something, different. but what they say is the disciples were indignant with James and John because three days after Jesus had given this other lesson, and he had just told them about being, if you want to be first, be last. If you want to be great, become a servant of all. And now that James and John, our brothers, have gone to Jesus and, and done this shameful thing, is that why they're upset with James and John? Aren't they upset because James and John got to them and tried to get in front of them again? What happens next leads me to believe it's the latter. Right? That, that they're mad because James and John are trying to wedge their way in in front of them again. And the reason I think that is because Jesus called them all together again. He doesn't pull James and John aside. He pulls them all together again. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise, over, ex exercise authority over them. He said, that's common core. That's how the world works. Not so you. Not so you. Because you belong to a new kingdom. You're ascribing to a different set of values, different goals, different objectives. Instead, he says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. Hey, guys, does this sound even remotely familiar to you? Have you heard something like this before? Didn't we just talk about this a few days ago? It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. At the climactic scene, climactic moment in Jesus' ministry, he kicks off the events of the last night that he was with his disciples and the last lessons that he would teach them before his um, arrest and crucifixion with a remarkable event. He pulls his disciples together. They're going to have dinner. They're going to sit down and celebrate. Um, and um, he washes their feet. And, and they're stunned because that was the role of a servant. And he is their teacher. Peter says, no, you'll never wash my feet, Jesus. It's not an appropriate role. It's not an appropriate thing for you to do. In this final meeting with his disciples, he, he models what he had been teaching them over and over and over again throughout his ministry as their teacher and his students. He says, hey, guys, this is what it looks like. And after he was finished, it says in John chapter 13, verse 12, Jesus said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You address me as teacher and master. Right? That's what we've been talking about. Te teacher, master. And rightly so. That is what I am. 
So if I, the master and teacher, wash your feet, you must now wash each other's feet. I have laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. If a servant is not ranked above the master, an employee doesn't give orders to the employee. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. If you want to be great, be a servant. It's the life that I've modeled for you. It's what I've been teaching you. It's what I'm showing. Do this. And because of the kingdom that we live in and the world and the way things are, which is not different, actually, than the world that they lived in. I think you find it remarkably sim similar, right? That the, the rulers and authorities lord it over people. Is this, is, is what Jesus is laying out here, is this really winning? Is this how you win at life? Is the goal of the Christian life to become the biggest loser? It is what Jesus is calling us to do as his followers to be doormats. You know, you know the story, right? From, from this moment that Jesus has with his disciples after he washes his de the feet, has dinner with them, teaches them, prays for them, goes out in the garden, has his agonizing prayer in the garden of Gethsemane, Lord, not my will, but your be, yours be done. He's arrested. This is like, this is winning. And everything that Jesus did, right, he never portrays himself as a victim. In fact, the opposite. He said, I'm a volunteer. If I wanted to, I could call down a heavenly host of angels and I could wipe you all out, right? I don't need, this is, I'm doing this of my own Father's will, and I'm submitting to his will. I'm not a victim. I am a volunteer. See, doormats are victims. And a doormat and a servant may look very much alike from the outside observer. But a volunteer servant is not being trampled on they're submitting to for the sake of others Jesus has humbled himself Paul says as a servant even unto death and the shame the shameful death on a cross and God exalted him to the highest place. That at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That service does, in fact, win. In this story, Caesar, who was the most powerful man in the world, at this point in history is actually a footnote in the story of the good news of the kingdom of God. I, it, G, Caesar is, is, is mentioned as, as a way to identify the times that the events are happening. He's a footnote in the story. And today, two billion people call Jesus Lord. He humbled himself, became a servant, and God exalted him to the highest place. It is the way of the kingdom of heaven. It is greatness in its truest form and in its greatest impact. It's true because it's true of the kingdom, it's actually true in our world now. We just don't practice it sometimes very well. But when people do, right, think about this. 
Right now, we're um, going through it in the wake of the pandemic, what some people are calling the great resignation, right? Countless people have, are refocusing their lives and, and their goals and their objectives and saying, I don't want to live like I was living before because I've learned some things from this. And so they're, they're quitting jobs and, and looking for new jobs. And, and so there are a lot of places that are trying to hire people and they can't people to get people to come and work for them. And what they're discovering is, hey, if you want to attract people to come and work for you now, you're going to have to lord a little less and serve them a little better. Hey, if you have your employees under your thumb, they don't want to work for you. And they're going to go find somebody else who won't treat them that way, who will honor them and respect them and, in effect, serve them. And if they do that, they will win. And if they don't right now, because it is a employee's world market, they will lose. It's true in the world. Think about the people that you admire and respect the most in your life. Is it the people who are looking down other, their nose at other people, who are lording, who are trying to control and manipulate and keep everybody in line with their agenda? Are the people that you admire and respect, are the people that you would like to be more like, are they people who are kind and look out for others and serve others that are generous? Service does win. But it is messy. Right? Jesus' service took him through the cross. It is messy. We're talking about dirty feet. I am great at service on my timeline, on my agenda. I can put it in my calendar this coming Saturday right? Food pantry, I'm going to be here. Good Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, I'll be here. And Operation Christmas Child, Saturday, 1130, I'll be here. Put it in my schedule. Great. On my terms. Trying to work God's kingdom and my kingdom kind of coexisting together. And, and I don't want to, like that kind of service, it's important. We need people to sign up for things and show up for things so that we can serve our community to be, to, to be able to rely on those. I, it's important. I'm not, not minimizing that. I hope you will sign up. I'm encouraging to sign up, to show up and do those things. Great. I'm not very good at service that's not on my timeline, that's not in my agenda. When service comes at my doorstep and asks me to lay down my agenda, not so good sometimes at all. There's part of, there's something inside of me that says, not now. And service often comes in untimely ways, in inconvenient times, and sometimes not in the kind of things that maybe we necessarily want to do. Like just simple little things that require us to adapt. Friday morning, our, um, one of our dogs got injured. The, the details are mysterious, but he clearly needed to go to the vet. I had, um, I had a plan on Friday. I had, I had things that I was going to do. I had a workout planned, and, and I had um, um, a, an event that I was going to be doing that later that night, and I had set time aside to prepare for that, and I have a castle that I call my house, and I had some things that I wanted to do around my house, and, and the vet was not part of my plan. And it's like, Deb says, and she knew, right? And I'm, she's like, I'll take off and take him to the vet. And there's a part of me that's like, <laughs> right? But I, this is actually my day off, and I have a plan for my day off, and it's my day off, and she's going to take off work. I think you can't take off work. I'll take the dumb dog to the vet, but I didn't do it because I wanted to. And I wasn't serving the dog, but I ultimately conceded to serving my wife. 
But that's kind of indicative of the way a lot of things happen in my heart when it's not on my terms and in my time. It's messy. It's hard. And here's another thing about dirty feet. They don't just get dirty. Sometimes they stink, too. And sometimes what we're called upon to do, it truly stinks. But as we do it, and in, when we do it, God moves through those situations in us and through us in ways that change us and in ways that impact the lives of other people. Greatness comes through service of all, not just the people that we like, not just when we want it to happen, I want to close just reminding you of two service opportunities coming up. These are on schedule, right? Two service opportunities. Saturday morning, 9 o'clock, food pantry distribution. We'll be here at 8 o'clock to set everything up and get it out there. If you haven't been to food pantry um, for a while, it would be great for you to come out on Saturday morning and, uh, and help us distribute food. It is a blessing to our community, and it is a blessing to those who, who are participating in it. I would encourage you, uh, join us. And then 11.30 on Saturday morning, Operation Christmas Child, um, donate gifts that are going to be packed in boxes and distributed to bring um, the good news of the Christmas story to kids around the world. We would love to have you with us um, Saturday, um, both in um, generosity and donating gifts and helping us pack the boxes and getting them to where they need to be for distribution. Two opportunities for you to serve, and they will be a blessing to the church and to the world, and um, also just a great time for us to be together, right, and to connect and, and to be family to each other. I want to challenge you with a third thing here, right? In your own pursuit of greatness, ask yourself this question. Who do you know who is becoming great through service? Who, who do you look at and say, I want to be more like them because I see their character and, and I see how their life is impacting others. I see how their greatness maybe isn't moving them up the corporate ladder, maybe isn't moving up the, the community, maybe isn't making them famous or rich. I see how their greatness is blessing. And I want to be more like that. Who is that person in your life? And I would like to encourage you to go have a conversation with them. Just ask them, what's it like for you to live the way that you live? I, I see this, I observe this, I admire it, I respect it. And one of the things you're going to do in doing is you're just going to bless people by affirming how you see them representing Jesus in the world. You're going to bless them. And, and that will be a gift to them. But it's also an opportunity for you to learn from them about what they have learned from the master, about their service, and about the struggles that they have and, and the things that they think and the, things that, and the ways that they feel, and you might discover that they're not a lot different than you, but maybe they've handled situations a little more differently that have been kind of an example of what it is that you're looking to be more like. You want to win. Whatever it is, right? If you want to win in sports, I guarantee you the best teams are the teams that have the players who are supporting the other people on their team. The best schools to work in are the, team, the schools that have a staff where all the teams, all the people are working together and supporting each other in the endeavor to be the best school and to do the best job in educating our students. The best places to work are not the places where people are climbing and clawing to get to the top of the ladder, but people, places where people are encouraging and building up and helping each other out and supporting them and becoming the best that they can be at the things that they're doing. How do we become more like that? And just one final word, right? It takes us back to what Jesus taught us to pray. When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, we follow that prayer up with give us this day, Lord, our daily bread. Because if this is where we're going, I'm going to need some help. Lord, I continue to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Because you are calling every one of us to greatness. 
We are formed in your image and likeness and have infinite value inherent in us because we were created by you. But our lives were also made to matter to the world. We already matter to you. We were made to matter to the world, to have an impact, to be great. And while we fumble that in a thousand different ways in our pursuit of greatness that don't bring us to that goal, but, but you've given us lesson upon lesson and an example to follow and the promise of your spirit to empower us to walk and live in it. So Jesus, thank you for teaching us to serve. Help us to become better students, more faithful servants, and more fruitful followers for your kingdom. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you again for um, your presence with us this morning. Remind you, um, Church Center app, I want to uh, please get the app. We pay for that because we think it's going to be, it is and can be a really useful tool for our church in um, staying connected with uh, events that are going on, signing up for events that, um, that you're going to be a part of, um, submitting prayer requests. Uh, you can do that on the Church Center app. Um, and... Uh, Signing up for groups, which are going to be coming soon. We'll be talking about that um, in not, the not-too-distant future. Um, also, for giving and supporting the mission of the journey, um, you can do that on the Church Center app. Um, so please, uh, check that out and use it uh, to stay connected to our community and to be a part of the things that we're doing here. Um, as you uh, go out into this week, go with God's grace, walk and live in love in the power of His Spirit. Go in peace but not to pieces. Amen.